respected ulama ikram elders and beloved brothers in Islam of true value the real wealthy possession and true asset which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed every human being with is the life which we have in this world unfortunately when this concept of asset or wealth is spoken of then instinctively our mind tends to go in the direction of gold silver rands dollars little do we realize that all the material possessions of this world for them to be of any benefit or value to us this life which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that has to be there how many mornings how many evenings how many hours of this valuable possession of this valuable life which allah taala has given us we spent in allah's maasiyat in allah taala's disobedience countless mornings and evenings you find people sitting by what are you doing i'm passing the time i'm whiling away the time hours and hours spent in front of the shaitan box hours and hours spent on some soccer field or some cricket match time is being whiled away passing the time in frivolous leisurely activities which are of absolutely no benefit whatsoever allah taala has not given us this life And Allah hasn't given us this time in this world for us to while it away. Ye zindagi guzarne ke liye nahi hai, ye zindagi banane ke liye hai. This life is not to be spent and whiled away, but this life has to be made. We have to make it precious. We have to make it valuable. Unfortunately, when this most fundamental and most important of questions is put in front of us that how can i make my life valuable how can i make it precious how can i make it worthwhile then majority of humanity at this juncture tends to fail miserably in his understanding of what makes life precious like ulama put it they say izzat shohrat daulat iqtidar aur khwahishat worldly respect worldly fame and recognition wealth the acquisition of it leadership kingdom in this world that which is apparent that which is tangible the acquisition of the material things of the world which is in front of us that we have made it the mirage of our lives we have made that the goal we have made that the ideal we have made that the objective and we are competing with one another each one trying to get more each one trying to acquire more and considering this to be the goal and the objective considering this the manner in which people can be judged so and so has made his life valuable or so and so is a failure however the fact and the reality of the matter is that that allah who created this dunya that allah who created these worldly embellishments which are in front of us himself describes their true value many many verses in the quran just one verse will suffice for us ya allah taala says zuyyana lin nasi hubbu ash-shahawat min an-nisa wal banin wal qanatir al muqantarati min al-dhahab wal fidda wal khayl al musawwamati wal an'am wal harf ذلك متاع الحياه الدنيا 
In this verse of the Quran, Allah Ta'ala enumerates. Allah Ta'ala counts out before us in very clear and simple and basic terms the things which we consider to be valuable, the things which we consider to be precious, the things which we consider that if I have acquired this, my miraj is done, my life goals have been achieved. What are those things? Allah Ta'ala says, piles of gold, piles of silver, big, big buildings, horses, obviously, Quran was revealed in a time where the conveyance was horses. We can equate that in today's terms, contemporary terms, fast, fast cars, having big buildings. All this is enumerated. Allah Ta'ala says, Zuyyina lin nas. This has been beautified for you. It has been made attractive for you. And what is your response to it? Hubbu shahawat. Allah Ta'ala says, your love and your ecstasy and your desire for this is intense. You are deeply in love with it. You are mesmerized by it. You are caught up by its glitter and its glamour. The glamour of fast cars. The latest model. The glamour of big, big buildings. The glamour of nice long holidays in exotic destinations. Open any newspaper, see the adverts and see how people are attracted to all these things. And then that Allah who made all this in one word, in one word, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the entire humanity what is the value of all this. Allah ta'ala says, Zalika. Mata'ul Hayati Dunya. This, all this, what we have mentioned is Mata. Now, what is Mata? If you have to use the cripple and seriously lacking English language to translate this word Mata, we'll say possessions. These are worldly possessions. But for true understanding of Quran, there is no language in the world that will suffice. What this word mata means, there was one great expert in Arabic grammar. His name was Allama Ismai Rahmatullahi. He was regarded to be a leader in his time when it came to grammatical laws and to the meanings of the special hidden inner meanings of the words of the Quran. And when asked, how did he achieve this level? He said that whenever I wondered about the meaning of a word, then I would go to the Bedouins, those who used to live in the heart of the deserts, the villages. I would go and live amongst them and try and listen in their natural daily conversations in what context they use this particular word. And when I heard the context in which they used it, then I would get the correct understanding what this word means. Just to digress, this Allama Ismail, it is said about him, that he had a very dark complexion. And he was not considered handsome at all. But his nasib was such that he got married to a very beautiful woman. One day his wife was standing in front of the mirror, admiring herself. And then she looked at him and she said that, I am sure that both of us are Jannatis. So he says, how can you be so sure? She said, every time you look at me, you make shukar. Allah Ta'ala is going to give you a Jannat for your shukar. And every time I look at you, I make sabr. And Allah Ta'ala is going to give me Jannat for my sabr. That is why generally we find women's nature is like that. They say the only time you'll find a woman speaking good about her husband is before marriage and after he dies. In between, you'll find, very rarely you'll find a woman speaking good. But obviously that depends on the type of effort a person makes in his home. Nevertheless, coming back to what we were talking about. So he said when he came to this word mata. I went to live amongst the Bedouins in one village in the desert, waiting 
for an occasion to arise when they will use this word mata in its natural context in a normal conversation where they haven't been induced to use it. He says six months pass. This was the manner in which our salaf salihin our pious predecessors of the past finished themselves and exerted themselves. People would travel many, many months, arduous journey just to acquire the knowledge of one hadith. The scholar of Nahwa, of Arabic grammar, spent six months in the desert with a group of villagers to try to understand the meaning of one, ver- one word, not ayat or not surah, one word of the Qur'an. So he says six months pass and one day one woman from amongst these Bedouins she cleaned her pot and to clean the pot she used a dirty old rag which she had always used. Now that rag which is used to clean the remnants of the food in the pot we can imagine what the condition and what the state of the drag would be. She had left it one side. They had already eaten and they were relaxing on one side. A dog came running from the mountain. It started sniffing around for some food. Because they had already eaten, there was no food. So this dog eventually when they became aware that there's a dog running around their tents, they started screaming, trying to chase it away. In its fright, it grabbed a hole of the rag, which was used to clean the pot, and ran towards the mountain. This woman screamed, Ja al kal, akhaz al mata, wa farra il al jabal. That the dog came, it took mata, and ran towards the mountain. Allama Ismail. There was no way of describing his joy, finally, what he had been waiting for for six months was finally achieved. The usage of this word mata in its natural context by the Bedouins to make him understand that Allah is saying to you in the Quran, all the wealth, all the possessions, all the attractions, all the glitter and glamour of this entire dunya which you love with a passion, which has been made enticing and beautified for you, its value in the sight of your Allah is equivalent to the dirty rag that is used to clean the inside of a pot. أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثَا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ Allah Ta'ala says, O insan, do you think you have been created in vain? There is no purpose, there is no object, there is no goal behind your creation. That like mad people in a rat race, you are chasing after this dunya when you have no guarantee for tomorrow even. You have finished yourself, put your children in that and generation upon generation, no distinguishing line between a believer and between an unbeliever. أَيَحْسَبُ insan أَيْ يُتْرَكَ suda. Oh insan, do you feel this life is just now? That it is going to end here and there's nothing going to happen after this? That you can live this life as you want to live it? أَلَمْ يَكُنْ نُطْفَةً مِّن مَنِيِّ يُمْنَا ثُمَّ كَانَ عَلَقَةً فَخَلَقَ فَسَوَّى فَجَعَلَ مِنْهُ الزَّوْجَيْنِ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى Allah Ta'ala says, why don't you think there was a time when you were got a drop of sperm? Then we took you stage upon stage of creation till we made you the paragon of our creation, till we made you insan. Then death will come. You will be placed in that ground. That life which you consider to be everything. Those worldly possessions, the acquisition of which you consider to be something of value. All that will have been left behind. Oh insan, do you feel that it ends there? أَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ بِقَادِرٍ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يُحْيِيَ الْمَوْتَى Is not that Allah, is not that Allah, who, had, who, who could, is not that Allah who 
from a drop of sperm granted you this existence is not that Allah of such a power. Does he not possess the power to once again resurrect you? Bala, 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 qadirina ala an nusawwiya banana. Allah Ta'ala says, not only will I resurrect you, not only will I resurrect you, not only am I qadir on that, but I will resurrect you in such a fashion that your unique fingerprint which you have in this world, that also will be exactly the same. بَلَا قَادِرِينَ عَلَىٰ أَن نُسَوِّيَ بَنَانَا You will be resurrected and you will have to give account for the life in this world. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِّنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ Allah Ta'ala says, O insan, you have complete and absolute knowledge of the attractive possessions of this world, but of akhirat you are ghafil. The purpose and the object of your creation in this world, the manner in which you will make this life precious and valuable, my respected brothers, is not the acquisition of the material things of this world. This human being by his very nature does not possess the intelligence. He does not possess the intellect to work out on his own what makes this life valuable? What is my goal? What is success? What is failure? In which direction am I supposed to be going? What has value? What is of no value? This knowledge or the answer to these fundamental questions, this insan on his own does not possess the intellect to answer this. If you want to know what makes this life valuable, then we have to go back to the source. We have to go back to that Allah, that Allah who gave us this life, that Allah who made us insan, that Allah who has made this earth, that Allah who has placed us on this earth. And not only placed us on this earth, that Allah who decides when we will leave this earth also. Who wants to die? In reality, very few people really want to die. No one decides when he is going to die. A lot of times you hear people hear this expression, he escaped from the jaws of death. He escaped from the jaws of death. Bewakuf. In reality, death did not even open its mouth. There is no way you are going to escape. If death came, then there is no question of escape. فَلَوْلَا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُومِ وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذٍ تَنْظُرُونَ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْكُمْ وَلَاكِنْ لَا تُبْصِرُونَ Allah Ta'ala says that when that ruh reaches the hulqum, when that person is in sakarat and you see him in that fancy hospital bed with the latest technology and equipment around him, you see the eyeballs rising up so that only the white is visible. You see the froth gathering around his mouth. Unfortunately, my respected brothers, very few of us have the time to even see this. We are so caught up in dunya. Very few of us have the time to stand in the Qabristan and look at that black hole. When we are in our revelry, and when we are in our musti, and when we are looking at that zina taking place on that shaitan box in front of us, that is the time we should visualize the whole of the qabr. That is the time we should visualize those moments when we stand in front of the hospital bed of someone else who is in sakarat. And ask ourselves what guarantee we have that in the next hour that won't be us. At the time when we are spending till late at night in front of the shaitan box, so that when that azan for fajr goes, and then muazzin that call of Allah calls out to the masjid, we find it too difficult. 
We find it too difficult to remove that blanket and come to the masjid. At that time we should visualize this manzar and scene which Allah Ta'ala says to you, فَلَوْلَا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُومِ وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذٍ تَنْظُرُونَ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْكُمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُبْسِرُونَ Visualize this. He is gasping. His eyeballs have gone into his head. The froth has gathered around his mouth. فَلَوْلَا إِن كُنْتُمْ غَيْرَ مَدِينِينَ تَرْجِعُونَهَا إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ if you are not prepared to accept what we are saying to you, that the life of this world is not in vain, that it is not kel, kud and tamasha, and enjoying yourself and outdoing and competing with one another, as if there is no tomorrow, as if there is no cover, as if there is no accountability, then Allah Ta'ala says, if that is the case, tarji'unaha, return back his ruin to the body. Give him an extension. Like when the lease is expiring, you want an extension. When the transaction is finished, you want an extension. When the loan time payments comes, you want an extension. Allah Ta'ala says, if the acquisition of worldly wealth and worldly possessions, and this competing with one another is the object of the life of this world, then when the sakarat starts, give him an extension. But like the poet says, وَإِذَا الْمَنِيَّةُ أَنْشَبَتْ أَغْفَارَهَا أَلْفَيْتَ كُلَّ تَمِيمَةٍ لَا تَنْفَعُوا That when moth bears its claws, when moth bears its claws, there is no force and no system in this world which is going to benefit you. أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا The life of this world is not without purpose. مَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَاعِبِينَ مَا خَلَقْنَا هُمَا إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Allah Ta'ala says, we did not create this heaven and this earth out of games for amusement. مَا خَلَقْنَا هُمَا إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ There is a حقيقي purpose. ذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمُ الْحَقِّ وَبِالْحَقِّ أَنزَلْنَا وَبِالْحَقِّ نَزَلْ This is truth, there is reality, there is purpose behind the life of this world. That Allah, who has brought a universe with such system, it's not my intention to go into a biological lesson, time is too limited. But just by way of example, the extent to which Allah Ta'ala has placed system in this world, where there is no margin and no room for error, this atmosphere which is around us, which we take for granted, has 21% oxygen. Millions of years have passed, still the level of oxygen stays the same. There is no visible regulator, no vis visible valve. This is insan's requirement, so Allah Ta'ala has kept it at that level. They said if the level of oxygen increases just by 2% to 23%, the number of accidental fires that are taking place will increase 700 times. If it has to go up to 25%, then besides the North Pole and the South Pole, Everything else in between will be burned to ashes. It is staying exactly 21%. What is insan's contribution to this? We breathe in fresh oxygen. We breathe out carbon dioxide which is poison. To regulate this balance, Allah Ta'ala has put the trees of the world put the leaves of the world to work to produce that oxygen which this insan is using up. In fact, this entire universe has been subjugated to the service of this insan. So that everything around us is a living testimony and a reminder to us of the greatness of Allah, of the Qudrat of Allah, of the Kibriyai of Allah, of the Jabaruit 
of the jabariyat of Allah, of the hakimiyat of Allah. And within this insan, that lungs which we have, it is said each lung is made up of one and a half million air sacs. If these lungs are to be opened up, they will fill a football field. To carry the blood in the body to the lungs, there are 50 billion tubes which are transporting 10,000 liters of blood a day to the lungs. Why? Because in order to purify and cleanse the blood, it requires a bath of oxygen. That insan who came from a drop of sperm, where did he get this knowledge? That to clean my blood it requires a bath of oxygen. How did that system come into place to transport this blood in order to give it a bath of oxygen? And then subconsciously, each day you are breathing in and out 20,000 times. In just, like I said earlier, it is not my intention to go into a biological lesson, but just consider. 21% oxygen, 1.5 million air sacs, 50 billion tubes, 10,000 liters of blood being bathed in this oxygen, insan breathing in and out 20,000 times. How many countless different measures have to be in place just for each breath of air that you are breathing in? And are you not by every breath of air which you are breathing in without acknowledging the greatness of Allah, are you not expressing your ingratitude to Allah? Each breath of air is reminding you, make sujood before Allah. Recognize the greatness and the deen and the favor of your Allah upon you. And then coming back to what we were mentioning earlier, that Allah who has created a universe with such system, such perfection, everything in a perfect proportion, everything in a perfect measure, no room for error, not to the extent of one second or one millimeter. Is it conceivable? Is it conceivable that the same Allah will create a system amongst insan that on the one side, on the one side you have that person who will lie, who will cheat, who will deceive, who will usurp the rights of others, will steal from the pockets of others in order to fill his coffers. And on the other side is that person whose children will go hungry, who live in a simple home, who will undergo a life of extreme difficulty and hardship, but will not steal one penny from the next person. Is it conceivable that, that Allah will let the hereafter of these two be the same? That woman who dances naked on the stage, and that woman who no strange man has even seen one strand of her hair, can they be equal before Allah? That person who in the dead of night is in the casinos, is in the places of haram. And that person who is standing on the musalla and crying night in and night out, can they be the same? That person who each time he opens his mouth, breaks the heart of someone, hurts the feeling of someone, insults someone, swears someone. And that person who will forego his right in order to see the next person happy, can the two be the same? What is our reaction? What is our reaction? There is there's that tabqa and jamaat who three, four o'clock in the morning are out of their beds crying before Allah, where the azan of fajr are in the masjid. And then there is that tabqa and jamaat, years have passed. It is only the rising sun, or it is only the call of the business that causes them to come out of their bed. 
And when the call is made by, change your ways, change your life, come back to the masjid, come back to Allah, make tawbah from this wrong. What is the normal reaction? Allah is ghafoorur rahim. Allah is very forgiving, very merciful, so it is okay. That Allah who created a universe with such system, perfection and proportion, is it conceivable that that same Allah is going to equate these two people? أَفَنَجْعَلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كَالْمُجْرِمِينَ مَا لَكُمْ كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ أَمْ لَكُمْ كِتَابٌ فِيهِ تَدْرُسُونَ إِنَّ لَكُمْ فِيهِ لَمَا تَخَيَّرُونَ Allah Ta'ala says, what do you think? What do you think of your Allah? That the one who obeys Him, the one who undergoes hardship, sacrifice, difficulty, endures untold, sacrificing of his desires for the pleasure of Allah. And the other one who does as he wants and says, Allah is Ghafoorul Rahim, Allah Ta'ala says, do you think the two are going to be the same? Am lakum kitabun fi tadrusun. Where is that book where you are reading these things? Allah is asking you. Where is that book where you are reading these things? Where is your justice? مَا لَكُمْ كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ What type of justice is this? My respected brothers, the life in this world is precious. Allah has not given us this life to while it away. Allah has given us this life to make it. How we will, how we will make this life valuable? For that, we do not possess the intelligence. We do not possess the intellect, we have to go back to Allah. But Allah is such, مَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَن يُكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا مِنْ وَرَائِحِ إِلَّا وَحْيًا أَوْ مِنْ وَرَائِحِ جَاب Allah's system is such that Allah Ta'ala does not speak directly to insan. We cannot see our Allah, we cannot hear our Allah. We cannot speak to our Allah. We cannot ask our Allah, Ya Allah, you have given me this life. You have created this dunya for me. You have put this entire creation into my service. Oh my Allah, what do you want from me? How can I make my life precious? How can I make it valuable? How can I please you? How can I earn akhirat? How can I become successful? We cannot ask Allah these questions directly. For that, Allah Ta'ala put into place a system, ma'asum, pure, venerable, chosen slaves of Allah. From Adam alayhi salam, approximately 124,000 anbiya alayhi salam was sent throughout the ages in order to introduce this humanity to Allah. In order to show us the road, to show us the direction, to show us what is valuable, to show us what has no value. When that driver of ours is driving and he makes one wrong turn and we discover two or three kilometers in front that, hey, why? You're going wrong, you have to go back. There's no words to describe the hasrat and the regret. I am three kilometers off, or I am four kilometers off, or I lost ten minutes, or I lost twenty minutes. What will be the regret of that person whose entire life was in the wrong direction? Whose every day and every night was spent acquiring something that he thought was valuable but had no value? Whose every day and every night instead of earning Jannat and eternal pleasure was spent in earning Jahannam. And he only realizes at the last point that hasrat and that regret Quran describes Hatta Ida Jahadahumul Maut Kala Rabbir Ji'un. That when moth comes to them, that is the time they say, Rabbir Ji'un, O may Allah send me back. Now I will do good deeds, I will mend my ways. Another verse Allah describes this, 
ولو ترى اذ المجرمون ناكسوا رؤوسهم عند ربهم ربنا ابصرنا وسمعنا فارجعنا نعمل صالحا انا موقنون لا says if you could see the day when those who had wasted their lives in this world will lower their heads in disgrace in front of Allah they will say Allah today we have seen today we have heard today we have understood send us back When a person is going off the track, when he is going in the wrong direction, someone holds his hand, someone cautions him, someone warns him, by the road is not that way, it's this way. If he is a person of true intelligence, how indebted does he not feel to the one who has shown him the direction? I cannot thank you enough, I cannot show you enough gratitude. What then must be the level of gratitude? And what then must be the level of indebtedness? And what then is not the level of ihsan of that personality who came to show us not just the direction of one road, but came to show us in what lies success, dignity, honor, status, achievement, call it whatever you want, of dunya, qabr, and akhirat, who when he catches hold of the hand of Abu Sufyan, and says to him, Ya Abu Sufyan, in that mode of expression, Ya Abu Sufyan, is not only meant Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan is in front of him, that is why he's saying Abu Sufyan, but what is meant, Every male, every female, every child, every adult, every non-adult, every educated, every uneducated, every black, every white, every race, every color, every creed, every nationality, of every era and every period and every facet of human existence till Qiyamah. He holds the hand of Abu Sufyan and addresses everyone and says, جِئْتُكُمْ بِخَيْرِ الدُّنْيَا وَكَرَامَةِ الْآخِرَةِ I have brought that way of life from my Allah. I am that mold and I am that model that accept what I am giving you and not only will you earn the success of akhirat, you will earn the dignity and honor of this dunya also. To show this insan the way to Allah, the chain of Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam was put into place. It was our naseeb. We were fortunate selection from Allah that without our asking, without our requesting, Allah Ta'ala raised us and Allah venerated us by giving us the distinction and honor to be included in the ummah of that Nabi who when Allah speaks of his nubuwat in the Quran, Allah says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah has specially favored you. Allah has specially favored you when He sent you or He sent amongst you or included you in the ummah of Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No other Nabi, Allah Ta'ala takes custom on him in the Qur'an. Allah Ta'ala takes custom on the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لَعَمْرُكْ إِنَّهُمْ لَفِي سَكْرَتِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ By the custom of the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No other Nabi on his speech Allah takes custom. Allah takes custom on the speech of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَقِيلِهِ يَا رَبِّي By the custom of the call and the speech of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is that Nabi throughout the ages, from Adam alayhi salam, every Nabi, every Nabi was commanded by Allah to tell his ummah of the coming of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Throughout the ages, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is coming. These are his attributes. This is his beauty. This is his perfection. Nabi upon Nabi was telling the Ummah, Muhammad Sallallahu is coming, Muhammad Sallallahu is coming. One year before that Nabi could come, 
Allah Ta'ala makes it such in the entire world not a single female child is born. One year prior to the coming of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for that entire year only male children were born in honor of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Finally, finally that night dawns when the bridegroom of humanity was to finally make his appearance. Look at the effect on the entire Kainat, on the entire universe of that night. The superpower of the time, there were two superpowers, one was the Iranians and the other was the Romans. The Romans were Christians, or so-called Christians. The Iranians were fire worshippers. In the court of Nosherwan, who was the ruler of the Iranians, there was a fire. They used to worship fire, so they used to fuel this fire. It had been burning for 1,000 years. There was a group of people that were deputed 24 hours of the day. Their only job was to see that this fire continues to burn. It does not burn out. Keep giving it wood. Keep giving it fuel. On the night that Rasulullah was to be born, suddenly that fire is put out without any explanation. The palace of Nosherwan, the ruler of the superpower of the time, 14 pillars of that palace, again with no explanation, come crumbling onto the ground. The throne of every king present at that time in the entire world on that night, with no explanation, is overturned. If that king is wearing his crown, that crown falls off his head. A yatim is to be born, an orphan is to be born. Normally, if we look into the annals of history, in the history books, there is very little space reserved for the mention of orphans. We'll find a lot of information on rulers, on conquerors, on mighty kings, very little mention we will find about orphans. But miraculously when it came to this orphan, every aspect of his existence, like, like Allah took upon himself the protection of the Qur'an. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidhun because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the living Qur'an like Allah took upon himself the protection of the Qur'an in the same way Allah took upon himself the protection of every aspect and detail of the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no personality in history regardless of whichever religion or whichever era he lived in, to which every aspect of his existence has been recorded like this. If you look at the Christian calendar, the date of his birth, 22nd of April 571, after the demise of Isa alayhi salam. That they say after demise, that the reality after Isa alayhi salam was taken up, if you look at the Islamic calendar, Islamic calendar hadn't started yet at that time. So it was calculated, it took place in Amul Fil, the year when Abraha attacked Baytullah, six months after that, six months after Allah had miraculously destroyed the army of Abraha, it was a Monday, approximately 4.20 in the morning, the time of Suba Sadiq in the month of April. Suba Sadiq takes place at about 4.20 in the morning in Makkah Mukarrama. It was a Monday, Amul Fil, that the pride of humanity 
جناب رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم was born if we look at his birth that also absolutely miraculous every aspect recorded father's name Abdullah who predeceases him mother's name Amina midwife who assisted in his birth Shifa the mother of Abdurrahman bin Auf foster mother Halima each of these names carry significance what am I explain they say is Abdullah father's name his inception occurred his inception occurred in the oven of Abdiyat mother's name Amina he was nurtured in the womb of Aman and peace Midwife Shifa, that personality who came to cure the maladies of humanity was being born. Foster mother Halima, he drank milk from the breast of Hilm and Akhlaq. Born in the month of Rabi al Awal, why not Ramadan? Why not Zul Hijjah? Why not one of the sacred months, the Ashur i Hurum? Ulama say his personality was sad. That he did not need a sacred month. His birth gave sacredity and gave recognition to the month. Born in a desert, there was no vegetation. Why he was the vegetation? There was no water, he was the water. Rabi ul awwal, Rabi'a. What does this word Rabi'a mean? Spring. Why spring? Allah may explain. They say the onset of spring promises humanity that the ravages of winter are over now. Spring has come. He was born in Rabi ul Awal. The entire humanity is being told that the ravages of the darkness of kufr and deviation have come to an end and the spring of Muhammad wasallam has come. They say the rain, the rains of spring cause freshness and greenness to spread in the world. So the rain of the nur and nubuwat of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is going to cause greenness and freshness in the iman of the hearts of humanity to be spread. Born at Subha Sadiq, at the breaking dawn, this universe announces that darkness and nightfall is over. Dawn has come. Light has come. Allah makes the birth of His Nabi at that time so that the hearts of humanity are told that the darkness of kufr and deviation have come to an end and the source of light, the sun of humanity, the pride of humanity, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has come. Afalat شموس الأولين وشمسنا أبدا على أفق الأولى لا تغرب. Like the poet says, the sources of light, the suns of the nations of the past have set. Our source of light, our guidance, our hadi, our rehber, Muhammad Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Kiamat will come, Kiamat will come, but his sun will not set. His source of light will not be diminished. Alama Suyuti Rahmatullahi mentions the riwayat relying on the authority of Abu Nu'aym's Hilya that the mother Amina, the mother of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam she says, I carried him for nine months as the period drew close of his birth I began to experience the same discomfort and the same pain and the same difficulty that other women experience just as that began Faraid Kaanna Janaha Tayrin Abiyad Masaha ala Fuadi Fadahaba Anni Kulla Rabin wa kulla wajin kuntu ajidu. She says I saw a white bird coming down with its wing it massaged my chest. When it did that Every form of pain or discomfort which I experienced miraculously disappeared. Summa al 
فَإِذَا أَنَا بِشُرْبَةٍ بَيْضَاءَ لَبَنًا وَكُنْتُ أَتْشَى فَتَنَاوَلْتُهَا فَشَرِبْتُهَا She says, then I turn and I saw in front of me a container or a cup containing milk. I was thirsty. I picked it up. I began drinking it. When I drank it, فَكَشَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْ بَصَرِي وَأَبْصَرْتُ تِلْكَ السَّاعَةَ مَشَارِقَ الْأَرْضِ وَمَغَارِبَهَا ورأيت ثلاثة أعلام مضروبات علما في المشرق وعلما في المغرب وعلما على ظهر الكعبة She says I drank the milk and then Allah Ta'ala opened up my vision and the whole world shrunk and came in front of me I saw three huge flags one in the east, one in the west, and one on the center of the Kaaba. Just as this vision went away, I realized that painlessly the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam had already taken place. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam was next to me. Shifa, the mother of Abdurrahman bin Auf who was present. She says to my surprise when I looked at this baby, other children are born. They need to be bathed. This child was born so clean as if it was bathed before he came into the world. Other children, the umbilical cord has to be cut off. In Rasulullah's case, the umbilical cord had already been removed. Other children, khatna and circumcision has to take place. In the case of Rasulullah, she says he was bulida makhtoon and he was born with his circumcision already having taken place. This child was placed down few seconds, few seconds to the astonishment of Amina and Shifa. Rasulullah Sallallahu turns over and falls into sajda. Then he wakes up from the sajda. Shaakhisan basarahu ila sama. Raises his head up to the heavens. Picks up his shahadat finger. Points it to the heavens. And in infancy utters the timeless words. الله أكبر كبيرا والحمد لله كثيرا وسبحان الله بكرة وأصيلا Allah is the greatest glory be to my Allah morning and evening and praise be to my Allah excessively that zat and that personality who had come to raise the name of Allah on this earth had been born she says when he raised his finger to the heaven a light shone up which made it appear as if the sun had come into the home of Amina. Then a plume of smoke, Nazalat Sahabatun, a plume of smoke came down. Rasulullah was lying on the lap of his mother. فَغَشِيَتْهُ وَغَيَّبَتْهُ That plume of smoke covered him up so that momentarily he was invisible even to her. Then it rose up with him. And a voice called out from the unseen, Tufu bihi mashariq al-ard wa magharibaha liya'rifu bismihi wa na'tihi wa suratihi. Take this child to the east, to the west. Take this child to the oceans. Let the entire universe come to know the name of my Nabi. Let them come to know the attributes of my Nabi. Let them come to know the nobility of my Nabi. وَآتُوهُ خُلُقَ آدَمْ وَمَعْرِفَةَ شِيْثِ وَشُجَاعَةَ نُوحِ وَكُلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمِ وَاسْتِسْلَامَ إِسْمَعِيلِ وَفَصَاحَةَ صَالِحِ وَحِكْمَةَ لُوْتِ وَرِضَى إِسْحَاقِ وَبُشْرَى يَعْقُوبِ وَشِدَّةَ مُوسَى وَجِهَادَ يُوشَعْ وَحُبَّ دَانِيَالِ وَوَقَارَ يُونُسِ وَطَاعَةَ إِلْيَاسِ والصبر أيوب ولحن داود وعسمة يحيى وزهد عيسى واغمسوه في أخلاق النبيين grant him the akhlaq of Adam a.s. the marifat of Shis a.s. the bravery of Nuh a.s. the eloquence of Salih a.s. the wisdom of Lut a.s. the contentment of Ishaq a.s. the glad tidings of Yaqub a.s. the strength of Musa a.s. the jihad of Yusha a.s. the love of Daniel a.s. 
the reverence of Yunus alayhi salam, the obedience of Ilyas alayhi salam, the sabr of Ayyub alayhi salam, the voice of Dawood alayhi salam, the abstinence and the piety of Isa alayhi salam, وَغْمِسُوهُ فِي أَخْلَاقِ النَّبِيِّينَ and anoint him with the akhlaq of 124,000 Anbiya alayhi This was when he was just a baby of a few hours old. For the next 63 years, he rose in stature, he rose in nobility, he rose in greatness in the sight of Allah. We cannot imagine the extent to which every aspect recorded of the existence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Period of life in this world, 22,330 days and 6 hours. He passed away on Monday also. It was around 10.20 in the morning. 7th of June, 633 years. According to the Christian calendar, according to the Islamic calendar, 12th of Rabiul Awal, Monday morning at about 10.20. Number of days of Nubuwat, 8,156 days. Ulama say this is Zuhur and Nubuwat. This is when his Nubuwat became apparent. This was not his actual Nubuwat. Once Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala asked him, that, Oh my beloved Nabi, tell me when were you a Nabi? He expected the response to be, I was 40 years and 6 months of age. It was the 21st of Ramadan. I was in the cave of Hira. At night, Allah Ta'ala made me his Nabi. This is what Abu Huraira expected. But to his utter astonishment and surprise, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi says to him, O oh Abu Huraira, kuntu nabiyan wa inna Adam bain ar-ruhi wal jasad. Adam alayhi salam's mold had not yet been formed and already I was the Nabi of Allah. Nubuwat began upon him, Nubuwat ended upon him. Such a Nabi, really my respected brothers, not 12th of Rabi Ulawal, or not any day of Rabi Ulawal, or even the whole year, or even the whole life, if it is spent in describing the beauty and the perfection of Janabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Wallah, Allah's qasam, not only me, let the whole world get together and spend their entire lives describing his seerah, spend their entire lives describing his beauty and his perfection. Wallah, Allah's qasam, they will not do justice to even one particle of it. His entire hulya. There is no description of any other Nabi of Allah present. When it comes to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his entire appearance, that also has been preserved. The color of his complexion, Azharul Loon, Abiyad Musharraf, he had a luminous complexion. It was white with a tinge of redness in it. Rajil al in infaraqat aqiqatuhu infaraqa wa illa fala yujawizu sha'ruhu shahmata udhunayhi idha huwa wafarahu His hair was slightly curly. The man, the center, sometimes it would not be there. Sometimes he would comb it such that the man was visible. Whenever his man was, was visible, sahaba say a light used to shine from it. It was his adat and mubaraka that he would keep his hair up till his earlobes. Sometimes when he went on journey or there was an opportunity, sometimes the hair, either because of journey or sometimes intentionally, he would allow the hair to come halfway between his shoulder and his earlobes and somewhere and very rarely up till shoulder length. But the general length of his hair was up till the earlobes. Azimul Hama, his face was moderately large. Lam yakun bil mutahham, wala bil mukalsam, wa kana fi wajhi tadweer. He did not have a completely round face, nor did he have an elongated face, but it was between the two. 
When it comes to the eyes of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the hadith we find five words describing ashkal, adajul aynain, ahwar, akhal, ahdab. The white of his eyes was extremely white. There was red lines running through it. The blackness was extremely black. He had prominent eyes. It would always appear as if he had surma. His eye lashes naturally were long, which is a sign of beauty. Even to this extent, his gaze is described. Jullu nazrihi al mulahaza. Nazruhu ila al ard atwal min nazrihi ila al sama. Sahaba say he would not stare at people. He, he possessed such humility that generally he would keep his gaze low. His gaze towards the earth was much more than when he looked up. If he looked up also, they say he would just glance. Just briefly glance and then look down again. That Nabi, that Nabi whose humility is such that leave women looking at men, looking at men, majority of his look would be a glance. And his ummah, father, mother and children, naked men and women dancing, committing zina in front of them, father, mother and children, Long, long hours late into the night staring openly at that. Where is the sunnah? Where is the munasabat and link with the life or with the humility or with the haya or with the shame of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Then Muharram comes for 10 days. We want to celebrate Muharram. Rabiul Awal comes for 12 days. Seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the rest of the year, carry on as we were carrying on before. That, my respected brothers, is not deen, that is a mockery of sharia. That is a mockery of the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His seerah is not there for bayans only. They say he would, at men also, just glance. And if he looked up, such was the awe, such was the love. Such was the reverence which Sahaba Ikram had for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that not one of them had the courage to look directly at his eyes. They said amongst the companions there were only two companions that were so close to him that they would look directly at his face. That was Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma. Besides them, not a single Sahabi would stare directly at the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Amr bin As radiallahu taala when he's on his deathbed. It's a lengthy hadith. It's a brief section of it. He says that there was no one more beloved to me than Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Such was the level of awe and reverence that I had for him. That Allah's qasam, Allah's qasam, if you came to me and asked me to describe him, I would not be able to describe him because I never once looked directly into his face. That level of reverence and awe they had for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ali radiallahu anhu says, "Man ra'ahu badihatan habahu, wa man khalatahu ma'rifatan ahabahu. Yaqul na'ituhu lam ara qablahu wa la ba'dahu mislahu." Ali radiallahu anhu says, "That person who saw him all of a sudden would be overawed." As he interacted with him, he would begin to love him. And the one who described him would say, Before this and after this, I have never seen anything more magnificent and more beautiful than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jabir bin Samura radiallahu ta'ala who says, Kuntu fi laylati adhiyan. It was a full moon night. We were sitting in the courtyard of Masjid al-Nabawi. He says, I looked at the beautiful moon in its splendor. Full moon night. And I looked at the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He says, "Wallah, wallah." The face of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was more beautiful than the moon. 
Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala says, Ma ra'aytu shay'an ahsana min Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ka'anna shams tajri fi wajihi wa idha dhahikat yatala'lahu fil judur He says, I have never seen anything more magnificent than the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It appears as if the sun rose on his face and when he smiled, the reflection of it could be seen shining on the wall.